Good morning everyone. Thank you for joining our service today. A massive welcome to all of you. We pray that the Lord may bless you and keep you and connect with you in our service today. Ndia Nibulisa Nonking Gegama Lenkosi Yetu U Jesu Christu. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This week we have two birthdays according to our membership list. Membership list. On the 20th, which is Tuesday, is June Wheelwright's birthday. And then on the 23rd, which is Friday, it's Nell Gammon's birthday. So happy birthday to June and Nell and everybody else celebrating their birthday this week. May you have a blessed day, may you be spoiled rotten, and may you just experience God's blessings and God's love surround you, especially in the here moving forward. So happy, happy birthday. Let us now listen to the hymn, Crown Him With Many Crowns. to worship this morning comes from Joshua 1 verse 9 and here we read the following be strong and courageous do not be terrified do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go our God is always with us wherever we go and whatever we do whether things are good or things are bad whether things are happy or things are sad, whether things are changing around us all the time and we don't know how to cope with that change, or whether things stay the same, our Lord is always with us. And therefore we can be strong and we can be courageous. And so this morning, at the start of the service, let's remember all those times where God was indeed there for us, or the times God did in fact intervene. 
let's remember the things that the Lord has done for us. And as we come into his throne room, let's focus our minds and our feelings and our thoughts and our attention on our Lord as we come to connect with him today. Let's have a moment of silent and individual prayer. Lord God, you know us inside out and upside down. You know the places we go, the situations we find ourselves in, the things that bother us and worry us, and the things that make us feel like we're not strong and courageous. But Lord, this morning we come to worship and praise you that we know you are always there. Whatever may come, whatever may happen, you are always close at hand. We praise you and worship you that you are willing to hear us, willing to see us, willing to connect with us, willing to share your wisdom and your insight and your love and grace with us. Lord, we know that we don't often and always deserve it. Lord, you know the things and the places and the places we went and the things that happened this week where we did turn away from you, the times we did disappoint you. You know, Lord, the times where we gossiped, the times where we lied, the times when we didn't show and act in your love, the times we didn't fight for your justice, the times we didn't fear you and do what your will asks of us. The times where our pride got the better of us. Lord, we come to you now with all our sins as we silently and individually confess them to you. Lord, hear our confessions, see our repentant hearts. You know the guilt and the shame that we carry with us. Lord, come and cleanse us, come and forgive us, and let your grace and your mercy flow over us once again. Thank you, Lord, that we know that when we truly come to you, you understand, you have compassion, and you forgive. You take our sins and you separate it as far as the east is from the west, never to think of it again. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you are always close by. Thank you, Lord, that we can always count on you and trust that you are there. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful weekend. We thank you, Lord, for the people in our lives that truly love us and encourage us and are always there for us. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that we receive from your hand. But as we come together this morning, we come because we want to spend time with you. We want to connect with you. We want to feel your closeness. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you'll reveal yourself to us, that you'll help us to connect with you, that you'll help us to grow spiritually closer to you. If we need comfort, comfort us. If we need peace, grant us your peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, we ask that you'll be with us and all the services taking place in your name today as we come to praise you and worship you and read from your scriptures. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. In answer to the forgiveness we've just received, we're going to listen to the hymn, Praise My Soul.
our reading this morning comes from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 15, verse 21 to 18. I'll be reading from the NIV translation, and you are more than welcome to follow along with me. So Matthew 15, verse 21 to 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Ty and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, Son of God, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. And here ends our reading. May the Lord bless to us the understanding of his holy word. Matthew was a gospel largely written for new believers who originally came from the Jewish faith. And for this reason, as we page through this gospel, we pick up many references to the Old Testament. And to help us understand all the little details and nuances in this gospel, we therefore need to have a very good understanding about the Jewish religion and culture of the day. From the very beginning of the book of Matthew, Matthew tries to help his audience understand that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David, whom the Jewish people have been waiting for for such a long time. He was the fulfillment of the prophets and the promises that were made in the Old Testament. And Matthew also stresses the fact that the Jews do not receive and accept Jesus. They do not recognize him as the Messiah or the son of David. The scripture we read this morning is a very interesting reading for numerous different reasons. But to help us understand it, we need to understand some of the nuances of what happened just before we get to our reading. So we're going to begin by just taking a step back and seeing what happens as build up to this reading that we read together. In verse 21, we read, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. The first question we can maybe ask ourselves is, where was Jesus leaving from? Now, in chapter 14, verse 34, we know that he was in Gennesaret. And some Pharisees and teachers of the law approached him in the beginning of chapter 15 to ask him why his disciples break the traditions. Because they do not wash their hands before they eat. Now, to understand this, we must remember that for the Jews, there were very strict laws regarding what is clean and what is unclean. These laws were very, very important because one needed to be clean if you wanted to enter the temple. So this meant that certain foods, you cannot eat them. Certain people, you cannot associate with them. Certain things, you cannot do because all those things make you unclean, which affects your ability to go to the temple, which then affects your relationship with God. Eating with unwashed hands were considered to be unclean. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were concerned that this rabbi and his disciples seem so nonchalant about the laws. And so they question him. In verse 10, we read that Jesus then calls everybody together and he teaches them that what goes into one's mouth is not what makes you clean or unclean, but what comes out of your mouth is what makes you clean or unclean. When the Pharisees hear this, they are obviously very, very angry at Jesus' words because the Pharisees had a very important role to play in society. 
they were there to make sure that the people obeyed the law. Because in obeying the law, you stayed close to God. This was very important. Because if we go to the Old Testament, we see what happens when the people turn away from the law. They turn away from the law, eventually they turn away from God, God punishes them, and then the exiles happened. And to stop another exile from happening, the Pharisees were put in place to make sure that the people obeyed the laws so that they can't turn away from God again. So when Jesus, a rabbi, makes a statement like this, disregarding the law completely, of course it would anger the Pharisees. It would cause conflict and it would cause the Pharisees to start looking at ways to silence Jesus in some way to discredit him. The disciples, knowing this, then approach Jesus and tell him that he'd angered the Pharisees. Jesus then speaks to the disciples in verses 17 and 18, telling them, Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth and goes into the stomach then goes out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these things is what make man unclean. So what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples and his followers were radically different. After this happened, Jesus then decided to leave that place. Why? Because if we look at it from Jesus' perspective, I'm sure that at that specific time, Jesus felt under attack from everyone. The Pharisees were angry at him. They branded him a sinner to discredit him because he broke their rules and regulations. We know that Herod the king had just beheaded John the Baptist and he saw Jesus as yet another menace. The people from his own town in Nazareth treated him with disregard and dislike when he was asked to leave their place in chapter 13. And perhaps that's why he goes to Tyre, Tyre and Sidon to have a little escape to re-energize, to perhaps just seek some silence. Now the cities of Ty and Sidon were situated in Gentile country. These two cities were part of the Phoenicia cities, which was part of Syria. And even though they were part of Syria, they were still independent cities and they were rivals to one another. Now while Jesus and his disciples then are in this Gentile region, Canaanite woman, or in other words, a Gentile woman, approaches him in verse 2. Now, if we go back to the Old Testament, to Deuteronomy, and we read chapter 7, we see that God drove the Canaanites out before the Israelites. So there's a long history between the Israelites and the Canaanites, and it's not a good history. But this woman cries out to Jesus to have mercy on her because of her daughter suffering from demon possession. And what is very interesting is that she calls Jesus the son of God, the or the son of David. Now the son of David, this title, was a title the Israelites reserved for the Messiah, the one that was to come. Because of the son of David would be the one that had legal rights to the throne. So even though she's not Jewish, even though she's not an Israelite, even though there's a bad history between her people and Jesus' people, she still calls Jesus by this very, very important title. And this shows us that even though she perhaps didn't share the Jewish religion or understanding, she did notice that this man, this Jesus, could do something about her problem. Let's just think about this for a moment. Let's say that you are part of a group of people that have a very bad history with another group of people. For years and years there's been fighting against you. For years and years there's been anger and, anger and resentment between you. And now something happens and you need their help. Would you go and really seek that help from them? Would you change your attitude towards them to go and ask for this help? And even if you do that, what are the chances that that other group is just going to go, no. Now, if we look at this from this woman's perspective, she obviously had tried all the avenues that she could, and this was her last resort. 
to go and find this man that she's heard about to ask him to help her. The situation with her daughter caused her to change her attitude, to change her thoughts and to go and find help even if she knew that it was a risk, even if she knew that there was a bad history between her people and Jesus' people and even though she knew that it probably won't work, she still tried. We then read something that's mind-boggling to us. Jesus didn't answer her. He remained silent in verse 23. Now, just imagine how terrible this must have been for this woman. She's coming to ask Jesus for help. Someone she doesn't know, someone from a different group, and he ignores her. However, she doesn't give up. She continues to try. Finally, the disciples get so sick and tired of her and perhaps also a little bit embarrassed about this woman following them around and shouting at them that they go to Jesus and ask him to just send her away. And it's here where Jesus then answers in verse 24 and, say, and says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, what does this exactly mean? At that time, Jesus believed that he was only sent to save Israel, to save the Jewish people. He was sent to bring them back to God. Now, if that was Jesus' understanding and perspective, I can imagine that he felt a little heartbroken. He was sent for the lost sheep of Israel, yet they rejected him. This, after all, was the reason why he went to the Gentile country. He went there to get away from his own people, from the Pharisees, the teachers of the Lord, Herod, the people of the synagogue in Nazareth, believers in God, people who didn't identify him as the Messiah, but rather as a sinner, as a fake, as a rebel, as someone who's a threat. Now he comes into the Gentile region and here there's a woman, not even part of Israel, from a group of people that have a bad history with Israel. And she identifies him as the son of David. If we take a little look at Jesus, there are various times in the New Testament that he remains silent. He was silent before Herod in Luke 23 verse 8 to 11. This was after he was arrested before he was to be crucified. Jesus also remained silent before Pilate in Matthew 27, verse 12 to 14. There are many other times in the Bible where Jesus remains silent, when we would expect him to actually say something. He remained silent when the people wanted to stone the woman caught in adultery. Jesus stood beside her, bent down and started drawing pictures in the sand with his finger before he even spoke a word. Jesus was silent when Peter denied him. All he did is he gave Peter a look. So there are many instances that we can name where Jesus just keeps quiet. Often in these silent instances, Jesus searches our hearts and often this silence is more potent than speech itself. In the silence, Jesus forgives. In the silent look that he gave Peter when Peter denied him, it broke Peter's heart and brought redemption. In silence, Jesus despairs. What could he say to Herod and Pilate that could change their mind? Perhaps in this instance of our story, in this silence, Jesus was searching his own heart and searching the will of God. Jesus believed that he was sent for the lost sheep of Israel, but they rejected him. So what does he do now? What does he do when a gentle woman recognizes him as the son of David? Is it at this time in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus realizes and understands that perhaps his mission needs to change? In verse 25, the woman kneels before Jesus and pleads, Lord, help me. And Jesus replies to her request by saying, Is it not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs? Today we look at a dog and most of us see a dog as someone that's part of the family. But in the New Testament times, a dog was a symbol that showed dishonor. To the Greeks, a dog meant a shameless and audacious woman. To the Jews, a dog was a term of contempt normally used for Gentiles. So it doesn't matter how we look at it, but to have called someone a dog was an insult to them. 
In contrast, the Jews use this term, the children of God, to describe themselves. So with that in mind, what we read here is that Jesus says to the woman, it is not right to take what is meant for Israel and to give it to the Gentiles. What Jesus is trying to say here is that his calling was to come and to fulfill the promises of salvation made to the Jewish people. And that is what he should be focusing on. But the woman then answers Jesus with the same analogy in verse 27 by saying, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs off the master's table. And then Jesus answers her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request has been granted. Now, if we look at what happened between Jesus and this woman, but most importantly in Jesus within himself, we note a change. We note that Jesus started to understand that his mission needed to change. Jesus believed that he was sent for the lost sheep of Israel. But this story represents a new stage in Jesus' own mission. Because here in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gentiles begin to be included. Here we realize that God's plan is so much bigger than just the Jewish people. Here Jesus realizes that he was sent for the whole world. If we remember just before this incident, Jesus had the conversation with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the disciples about what is clean and unclean. Now many of them regarded some people as unclean. Gentiles were among the unclean. Jesus stated that it's not that goes in that makes a man unclean, but what comes out. So if he looks at this woman, what is coming out of her mouth? Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. What comes out of her mouth is something profound. What many Jews at that point was unable to recognize and see. And by healing her daughter and seeing her faith and including her into his salvation, Jesus accepts this new understanding of his mission. To love and save everyone. So if we look at this passage, we notice a change takes place. Change in the Canaanite woman that went searching for the help in the most unlikely place because she had faith that she would be helped by the son of David. We notice a change that takes place in her. We notice a change that takes place in Jesus' understanding of his mission. And this causes a pivotal change within the book of Matthew when it starts to include the Gentiles into the kingdom of God. Now, what does all of this mean for us? Sometimes we too go through difficult situations. Situations which causes us to think certain things. things to rethink certain ideas we have. Situations which cause us to change like the woman in this passage that we read about. And when we go through changes in our lives, in our thinking, at those times, where do we place our trust? Do we too in these times rely on God? This woman went to find her help from Jesus, even though she was an Israelite, even though there was a history between her people and Jesus' people. And she did not stop until she got him to help her. If we look at Jesus, this was a time where he was also going through change. He really believed he was sent for the lost sheep of Israel. Yet they rejected him and he found the acceptance from the gentle woman, which influenced and helped him to understand that he was sent for all the lost sheep of this world. This is what caused all of us to be included into God's salvation plan. Change is one of the constant things that we can be guaranteed in, in, of in life. Everything changes all the time. Just look at this here. We started out the year with so much hope and so much excitement. And then within a few months, we were in lockdown. Many lost their incomes, many lost their lives. Many of us had to change the way we do things, change the way we are interact, change the way we have church. Change is constant. And this here made us aware of it <laughs> to the worst degree. But what are some of the changes going on in your life at this present moment? Whether these changes are good or bad, they scare us. Because change invites the unknown. 
We fear change because we don't know what's going to happen or how things are going to play out. And this often leaves us unsettled and anxious. It leaves us troubled and scared. It leaves us worried. So what do we do when we face change? Perhaps, like Jesus, we need to just be silent for a little while. Perhaps we just need to figure out where we stand, what we think, what's going on. Is our will aligned with God's will? And this is often a very scary place to find ourselves in. But it's very important. Perhaps we need to change our mindsets like the woman who had to let her feelings about the Jewish people go to ask for Jesus' help. Changing our mindsets is a very difficult thing to do. It's not easy to motivate ourselves when we feel hopeless. It's not easy to change our attitude when we are in a place we really don't want to be. So how do we do this? We need to remember to hold on to God. Jesus held on to God while he came to the realization that his mission is including everyone. The woman held on to God because she knew that he would be the one that would be able to help her. And so we need to hold on to God whether, whenever change is happening around us. God is always available and always there to help us figure things out. He is our one constant when everything is changing. He is our rock. He is our anchor when we are in times of trouble and when we are scared. He is our saviour when we think we aren't worth it. He includes us into his kingdom, into his family because he loves us. He will not let us go. He is here. He will not give up on us. And therefore, we can hold tightly onto our call this worship this morning. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, our God, is with you wherever you go. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that we can rely on you. Thank you that we can trust you. Thank you that you've showed us time and time again that you are our saviour, our rock and our anchor. Lord, as we go through times of change, hold on to us. Give us stability. Give us courage and give us strength and grant us your wisdom that surpasses all understanding. Grant us your peace. Grant us your love. Grant us your forgiveness. Lord, you know each one of us by name. You know how many hairs are on our heads. You know us inside out. You know the worries we have, the anxieties we have, the things happening to us, the circumstances we find ourselves in, the changes going on. Lord, be with us. Lord, help us. Help us to hold on to you. For you are constant. You are always the same, yesterday, today and tomorrow. You are our Alpha and our Omega. Thank you, Lord, that you are great. Thank you, Lord, that you have everything in control. Thank you, Lord, that you care for us intimately. Thank you, Lord, that you listen and you hear and you see us every single day. Lord, we pray for all those who we know that need you in a special way. We think of the sick. We think of the poor. We think of those going through changes. We think of those who have to move, those who've lost their job, those who are, have, have to write exams, those who need you, Lord, in a very profound way. We ask that you will be with them all, that you will carry them and comfort them and wipe away their tears. Lord, thank you that you are so amazing and so good to all of us. Amen. We are now going to listen to the hymn, I Am Here.
Babalo le nkosi yetu u Yezu Kristu. Utando luka tiko, ubutle luwana lo moyo u yinkwele, malube naning nonke. In nao ma gichanare van Christus, die liefde van God, in die gemeenska van die heilige geest met alken van jylle wees en blij. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and with all those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen. May you have a blessed, blessed week where you feel God's closeness to you.